So, um, <clears throat> yeah, James gave a short introduction to uh, my talk earlier, mentioning uh, sort of feasting in uh, southern Britain and um, in the Aegean in the 8th century, so I'm going to sort of develop that. Um, so in this talk I'm going to suggest some similarities between two contemporary but otherwise quite different societies, uh, looking at southern Britain at the transition from the Bronze Age to the Iron Age, focusing on the 8th and 7th centuries BC, and comparing this with the Aegean at the same time, so the end of the Dark Ages and the Archaic period. In both places, um, there was an sort of increasing social complexity during this time. I will be arguing that feasting provided a means for these more complex social relationships to develop in both southern Britain and the Aegean. Um, in terms of chronology, uh, the Mycenaean sort of collapse um, happened about the same time as the move from the Middle Bronze Age to the Late Bronze Age in Britain. Uh, the Greek Dark Ages covers the same period as the British Late Bronze Age. Um, and the British earliest Iron Age is roughly the same as the Aegean Archaic period. We'll be talking mainly about this period, but sort of moving on to the British Middle Iron Age as well. Uh, so to start off, a quick summary of the archaeology of the two places. Uh, in the 9th century in southern Britain, at the end of the Late Bronze Age, settlements were small, each usually comprising just a couple of round houses, a few pits, and maybe a storage structure, but perhaps the home of just an extended family. Uh, settlements almost all look short-lived, perhaps only in use for a single generation. And the two examples, uh, the two plans, um, are both from the Thames Valley and the reconstruction is a Breen Down in Somerset. There aren't a huge number of late Bronze Age sites and the landscape appears to have been relatively sparsely populated by small groups of people. One of the surprising elements of the late Bronze Age is the lack of monuments. Apart from a few regional exceptions, there is a lack of monuments not otherwise really seen since, the, um, since the, before the introduction of farming. It appears that the level of social organisation required to build such feats of construction was not apparent, and the social benefits of bringing people together in the creation of monuments was not desired at this time. So what changed in the following centuries? In the early Iron Age, the population grows, although there's no real straightforward way to chart this. Uh, burials are rare, so can't really be used as a proxy, and early Iron Age houses um, are not that visible. But if we look at the Thames Valley, there are more than twice as many settlements and three times as many houses by the Middle Iron Age compared to the Late Bronze Age. And this actually underrepresents, really, I think, the population explosion. Settlements and probably houses last for much longer periods of time in the Iron Age. The majority of the settlements were in use for centuries rather than the generational sites of the Late Bronze Age. So in this graph, we're not really comparing like for like. Each settlement in the Iron Age represents many times more people. Uh, this is, again, the Thames Valley, plotting Late Bronze Age settlements on the left and Middle Iron Age on the right. Uh, many more dots on the right, especially um, in the Upper Thames Basin. Again, remember that each dot, in fact, represents many more people in the Middle Iron Age. Not only do settlements la last much longer periods of time, um, but we also have some sites that are much larger, comprising many more people than just a small extended family. Um, so moving over to Wessex, some of the large hill forts are good examples. Uh, this shows the houses, the circles, um, within Hamilton Hill and Beacon Hill. Um, Hamilton encompasses some 12 and a half hectares, and this shows how densely occupied the sites were. This is the late phase of Danebury. Um, so not only is Danebury uh, quite densely occupied, but there's clear zoning of activities. Um, four post structures uh, in the south, uh, southeastern half um, and houses around the outside. The roads passing through the sites in a much more ordered layout. But these hill forts, I think, demonstrate the existence of a kind of larger society in a better way. They are truly monumental features vast construction projects that must have involved hundreds of people. The largest were worked on for decades, even centuries, and the ability to rally such numbers of people together with a shared aim, also to feed and house the workforce, is a significant achievement that would have required a society with substantial power and social ability and a level of organisation stretching far and wide. This is simply not seen in the Late Bronze Age, where settlements just comprised small family units, 
and monuments basically weren't built. By the Middle Iron Age, a significant social shift towards more complexity, population density and organisational power had taken place. So that's a very brief introduction to some of the developments that took place in the centuries following 800 BC. Turning now uh, to the Aegean, I think we can see some comparable changes that took place around the same sort of time, although I'm not trying to argue the existence of similar societies at the opposite ends of Europe. Dark Age Greek society was much less complex than either the period before or after. Most sites held no more than a few dozen to a few hundred people. Uh, this is Attica. Uh, the population was relatively sparse. Uh, the map um, showed few settlements prior to 800, with numbers expanding during the 8th century. Um, and this graph shows the estimated population growth from uh, 950 to 700 BC. Uh, so again, a huge boom in the 8th century. Even Athens appears to have been just several small concentrations of houses and groups of graves in the Dark Ages, barely a town. But the 8th century population again rose sharply. In the archaic period, Athens, be Athens became the political centre of Attica with surrounding towns and villages uniting under the leadership. A new form of centralised government developed with official state institutions and the basic social unit of the household grouped into larger conglomerations. This was the foundation of the polis and um, the growth into the kind of complex democratic society of the classical period. Um, colonies spread across the Mediterranean in the archaic period and a common form of Greek identity was fostered. New forms of literary, artistic and intellectual um, expression can be seen with, for example, fine painted pottery being traded around the Aegean. Large stone and bronze statues were created and monumental temples made from limestone and marble, replacing the early mud, brick and wood examples. So the archaic period saw the development of a more complex society taking off in the 8th century and embedded by the 5th century with a level of organisation not seen in the preceding Dark Ages. So that extremely quick overview of the Aegean and Southern Britain during most of the first century, uh, first millennium BC, shows that although there were very different societies, there were some similarities. In the 10th and 9th centuries, relatively dispersed groups of people lived in small settlements dotted around the landscape. Population increased in the following centuries, settlements got larger, Society more complex and connected, and we see things like the construction of monuments that tell of more organised groups able to carry out such projects. But these are not really the comparisons I mainly wish to draw. Instead, I think more interesting is that similar processes took place at the beginning of this wider social change in both areas. In both southern Britain and the Aegean in the 8th century, there's evidence for large-scale feasting at prominent sites where otherwise fairly disparate groups of people got together, held ceremonies, probably undertook a range of other social events and feasted. Feasting is recognised as an important social device in anthropological discourse. It occurs across diverse societies, archaeological and ethnographic, and has various social roles. <coughs> feasts provide an opportunity to carry out a range of social activities, both during the feast and around the occasion. Otherwise, dispersed groups might gather together at certain times of year or at points of social change, a marriage, funeral or coming of age ceremony. People might get together and feast as part of religious events and to make sacrifice or offerings to the gods. Feasting can be used to establish alliances, mobilise labour, create political power and economic advantage and redistribute wealth. And I think in inherently social activity. It provides a public stage to demonstrate social pos positions through, for example, differences or similarities in the distribution and consumption of food. Brian Hyden argues that feasts revolve around the creation and maintenance of important social relationships. Establishing desirable social relationships constitutes the bottom line for many feasts. Feasts can essentially provide a mechanism for society to become more complex. And I believe that the explosion of feasting activity that took place in the 8th century in southern Britain and the Aegean provided a significant means that led to the more complex societies developed in the following centuries. So in southern Britain, uh, feasting was taking place at midden sites, uh, for example, Runnymede Bridge. Uh, Runnymede was an island in the Thames, now under the junction of the M25 and A30, 
um, although it started life as a palisaded island in the 9th century. Um, in, it is in the 8th century that we get evidence for groups gathering together and feasting on a large scale. Runnymede, like other earliest Iron Age midden sites, comprises substantial deposits of anthropogenic dark earth, rich in animal bones, smashed pottery, burnt stone, and an array of other finds. If we look at this, these graphs from Runnymede and other midden sites, we can see how much material we have. You can read that. It's only after about 800 BC that the accumulations, especially pottery and animal bone, become denser. Deposition gets more intense, the result of much larger, larger gatherings of people. This is the density of animal bone through time, and there's again an explosion in the 8th century. Here the richest area of bunny meat, um, some 20 kilos of animal bone was discovered in each cubic metre of anthropogenic um, dark midden earth excavated. 9,500 shards of pottery weighing 70 kilos was recovered in the same area, measuring just 13 square metres. And these are the sorts of dense spreads of bone and pottery that was discovered. Not just feasting, but an array of other activities took place at Runmead and other sites, with a focused ceremonial areas. These sites are immeasurably richer in material culture than um, contemporary settlements, and much of this appears to be votive deposition. Runnymede also sits in a significant location in the wider landscape. In the 9th century, it's on the boundary between the distribution of two sets of material culture and depositional practices. To the east, we get things in red in this map, like carp's tongue metalwork, often in larger and more varied hordes. Perforated clay plaques, possibly used for uh, baking bread, handled jars and ring works, are also only really found to the east of Runnymede. And the black icons show 9th century sites without those things. If we zoom out, we can see how Runnymede marks a boundary within the Thames Estuary and South East Britain as a whole. More than just distributions of different sorts of material culture, this indicates much more significant differences in practices like food preparation and consumption and votive deposition. So Runnymede is at the boundary between two wider cultural groups. Dispersed groups of people, including those who in the 9th century probably saw themselves as quite different, appear to have been meeting in large numbers in the early 8th century providing new opportunities for social integration. Great feasts were taking place, probably alongside a range of ceremonies and other social events, such as marriages and exchanges and funerary activity. This is something quite new in the 8th century, not only at midden sites like Runnymede, but wider within the record. There's very little evidence that people gathered together in any number or hosted communal social events in the 9th century. I believe that these feasts and gatherings that took, off, that took off in the 8th century provided the foundations for the larger and more complex society that developed in the following centuries. It provided the opportunity for individuals and groups to forge new relationships in this time of wider change. Ties could be made and maintained with large groups of people with the chance of cementing new social roles. Interestingly enough, gatherings and feasts were also taking off in the Aegean in the 8th century. Feasting was incorporated into the religious realm and took place at sanctuaries and cults and accompanied by the sacrifice of animals and votive deposition of objects. Although this did not begin in the archaic period, the period witnessed an explosion of this type of activity. For example, at um, Mount Lacaon in the Peloponnese, burnt animal sacrifices, feasting, midden accumulations and votive offerings expanded significantly in the 7th century. At the sanctuary of Athena in Athens, there was an explosion of votive offerings and feasting debris about, from about 750 BC, including bronze tripods and pottery. From the late 8th century, new sanctuaries emerged in the countryside and are developing urban areas, providing opportunities to build new social networks and connect dispersed people. The midden sites in southern Britain also saw an explosion of feasting and votive activity around this time. And I believe that in both places, this activity facilitated the development of more complex societies that can be seen in the following centuries. So sanctuaries and feasting sites provided the opportunity for dispersed communities to meet, forge new relationships, pass ideas and develop and ingrain new forms of political organisation leading to larger and more varied societies. So although very different societies were present in southern Britain and the Aegean in the early and middle first millennium BC, there are, I think, some surprising similarities. 
Both seem to have utilised central places for feasting and votive deposition to facilitate social change, ultimately leading to more complex societies. Thanks.